just uh, trying to learn the technology. Well, I take my watch off. Um, thought I'd give a, a title to it. Um, that didn't mean I necessarily had to fully understand the title, but presumably some part of me did. Uh, but I, I, I felt that whatever I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, probably it wasn't exactly what the, uh, the, what the title of the session suggested. So I uh, really congratulate the organizers, and, uh, of whom I'm not actually one, on this conference. They're very interesting. And thank them for that. But I'm not sure I want to thank them for being asked to talk about it. Uh, a topic that I, I thought I found rather uncomfortable. So what I've done is I, I start from the, the obvious things. One would say, well, that's better. Start from the, the obvious things that one would say about mathematics and economics and uh, try to get uh, more and more into the examples of uh, what mathematics is in, in economics. Uh, trying to be as relevant to the, the things that we are thinking about today as possible. I'm afraid it's therefore perhaps a little bit backward looking, which is partly because I think that uh, economics had uh, done a lot long ago, which uh, was really very relevant to understanding our current troubles which uh, somehow not got neglected. So I tend to be more backward looking in these things than, than most people. So I want to start, uh, I've got to find a, a way of uh, moving this on. I, I think mathematics is a part of language. Um, I, I'm not going to commit the full power of saying it's, uh, it's part of logic because we know there are some difficulties about that. Uh, uh, it's an advanced part of language and logic, and uh, we need it, whether in numbers or in symbols or in pictures, when the going gets tough. And uh, in economics, it doesn't always get particularly tough, and uh, I have no difficulty in agreeing that an awful lot of economics is going to be done without mathematics. Uh, of course, I'd love to have some equations and graphs in this talk, but I'm not going to. But I think I'm going to be doing some mathematics. It's just that I'll express it verbally uh, and see whether you think that's a, a reasonable account once I get to the end. Well, uh, inevitably, much of economic analysis is going to be couched in mathematics, probably not very difficult mathematics, because economics deals with things numerical, prices and quantities, as Duncan pointed out. And that's not the only reason for the increasingly, increasingly prominent role of mathematics. Among the subjects that economists take to be within their compass are choice, particularly optimal decisions, and that seems clearly something worth thinking about. Uh, and seems to have some relevance to reality, although I'm not going to insist that that's what it's all about. And human interaction, which is the other big subject that economics is about. And both of these seem to require mathematical representation of the, to express them in a way that you can actually start thinking about and explore them. Now, mathematics requires precision, I think. It's a tool for achieving clarity of statements. I know not everybody feels that expressing things in mathematics makes it easier to understand them, but uh, I realize that the main difficulty I have with papers in economics that don't use mathematics is that I find it very hard to uh, often to understand exactly what people think they're saying. I think the first and major point about mathematics is that it, it's a method of being clear. Uh, with an obvious difficulty that not everyone may find it easy to understand. So it, for, it should force you to be very clear in what you're saying, but that doesn't, of course, make it easier for somebody to take it in. 
And mathematics is supposed to establish logically correct arguments. I think that's right too, that mathematics is a way of getting your arguments right. And that doesn't mean that people who use mathematics always get their arguments right or relevant. It aspires to establish true statements and having the right aspirations is a very important part of what we do in any subject or in any area. Uh, that, that's why I like to hear people say economics is a science because I think that suggests that aspirations. It doesn't mean that it's a successful science but uh, it's the right direction to be going. Similarly with mathematics. Mathematics expresses its assumptions with precision and that invites a disciplined assessment of the truth of the deductions that you make and of the relevance and the validity. The use of mathematics also encourages us to explore the implications of assumptions that are quite poor approximations to reality, perhaps are totally imaginary. People talk about toy models, and they do because we have a lot of them in economics. Mathematical models are some of our most useful laboratory animals. Study of the prisoner's dilemma helps our understanding of actual situations that bore little resemblance to that simple model. Models of bargaining and negotiation show the role of mathematics in developing concepts. So it's not just a business of, of, of writing down assumptions and uh, calculating. It's a tool for conceptual development. A Nash bargaining solution may be thought of as new words, but it's more than that. It's a major step in understanding how people can interact. Once we've learned a simple two-person version, we can get on to analyse bargaining possibilities in real settings. Once we've studied the Nash bargaining solution, we should be better placed to start discussing how countries could reach some kind of agreement on dealing with global warming. Many of the concepts that play a leading role in economics are provided by mathematics, you see. Indeed, interestingly enough, they were supplied quite often by mathematicians. So it may be part of economics, it doesn't mean economists did it. As a major example of that, I nominate probability, a tool that allows us to describe uncertainty. Humans, perhaps, especially those in the economic or financial professions, have a great deal of trouble dealing with uncertainty. The world is suffering some of the consequences. Having a language to describe uncertainty did not and cannot solve all these problems, but it is an essential start. Ignorance or incomprehension of what's already established economics, I think, made a large contribution to the severity of the recent recession, and I intend to illustrate that thesis with some examples. Mathematics can be quite hard to use, difficult to understand. The problems we have to deal with are actually sometimes quite difficult. What are the likely consequences of having competitive markets for collateralized debt obligations? That needs to be translated into a precise mathematical question, which can then to an extent be answered. And the answer can be explained without mathematics, although most people seem to have some difficulty in understanding it when you put it into words. One could approach these issues by other means, of course. The alternative to mathematical formulation and reasoning would be analogical reasoning, I suppose. Looking for historical parallels or similar contracts you think are well understood. I actually haven't seen any success there. An example would be uh, this is an unfair example, actually. But there's a widespread claim that people should not take insurance, for example, buy certain kinds of swaps, unless they have an insurable interest. Taking insurance is entering a contract with uncertain consequences. So does that principle imply that people should not buy shares? Well, of course, it had better not, because uh, we can immediately see the disadvantages of that doctrine. There's an interesting set of issues here, all about incentives. 
Reasoning by analogy will not sort it out. You have to understand the logic of the situation, and that usually requires mathematics or something very like it. The first of the specific topics that I'll talk about, you will recognize, is rather general. Uh, I think, and a number of people think, that the major achievement of economics is to show that under certain circumstances, quite limited circumstances, competitive markets are optimal. It seems that some people have thought that means it is a good thing to have as many competitive markets as possible including a great variety of financial assets, such as options, swaps, and other derivatives. And that idea also implies that short selling, for example, should be available. Perhaps even that insider trading should be legal, since restriction on an economist's and economic agent's rights to trade seems to be the antithesis of a free market. Perhaps there are many who even regret that markets for loans can't be perfect, meaning that you, if it were a perfect market, you could borrow an arbitrary amount at the market interest rate. You wouldn't have to mention embarrassing things like collateral. The circumstances required for a free market economy to be optimal include a tax and transfer system that can be regarded as optimal. That involves what are traditionally called discretionary taxes, distortionary taxes. I don't at all mean that the taxes have to be lump sum. I do think that uh, you can extend the theory in just that way. It would be ridiculous if they were. But it can be disputed whether it's proper to assume that taxes are optimal, but it would not usually make sense to urge market regulation on a government on the grounds that its tax system is wrong, instead of putting arguments that the tax system itself ought to be put right. Our current disquiet with people's belief in free markets, actually, I think, has a quite different basis. Another assumption that's required if competitive markets are to be optimal is that there'll be no moral hazard. There is moral hazard if some person's actions have uncertain consequences which will be observable, although the actions themselves are not observable. A businessman presumably spends most of his time thinking and doing things that are not directly observable. When the project he has selected after unobservable thought operates, there will be observable consequences.